So good afternoon, everyone. And yeah, first of all, I want to thank you, Alex, for the opportunity to, yeah, to present uh, my work today. I feel that the timing of your invitation was perfect because, uh, yeah, because after two years away from the academic research, I just had the opportunity to start a new research group, which is hosted in uh, the ARNA unit, which is a public research structure for RNA biology. And as you said, affiliated to the University of Bordeaux in the Southwest of France. So since we are just starting the lab, uh, I thought it would be nice to, to share with you a quick overview of um, about which are our research interests, how we got here and which are the directions we want to take uh, scientifically. And uh, broadly speaking, in the lab, we use uh, C. elegans to study how specific uh, molecular interactions contribute to regulate gene expression, uh, gene expression programs that are important for animal development. And with a particular interest in understanding how the organization of gene regulatory molecules into larger and local ribonucleoprotein networks contribute as well to cell function. So in living cells, a large number of uh, these assemblies are known as uh, now biomolecular condensates. They behave as micrometric uh, oil droplets that are floating inside the cell. And as you have seen, they can eventually uh, fuse, meaning that they behave as a liquid and it indicates the absence of membranes and also the presence of uh, very fast internal molecular rearrangements. So this phenomenon is evolutionarily conserved and factors uh, that are known to regulate gene activity can selectively concentrate in these condensates and in different, in different cellular compartments, in the nucleus, in the cytoplasm, but also in response to changes in environmental conditions as we can see here. This is why the formation of these condensates intuitively appears as a cellular mechanism for the regulation of gene expression programs. However, due to their highly dynamic and complex nature, we lack the experimental tools to characterize and manipulate these condensates in their physiological context. And this is why the biological function of these condensates are generally underexplored and their contribution to regulate developmental uh, gene expression programs in some cases is still controversial. So here's where we think C. elegans uh, offers unique advantages to bypass these limitations. First, because C. C. elegans germ cells contain already uh, P. granules, which is a paradigmatic model of a biomolecular condensate. And second, C. elegans is a transparent animal, it's a transparent worm, it's a nematode. And we can follow, ideally, P. granules in physiological conditions along different steps of germ cell differentiation. So the C. elegans germs, uh, germline is a syncytium. It has this characteristic uh, U-shape. And inside a pool of germ cells, of germ cell nuclei, divide mitotically and migrate away from a stem cell niche in this uh, distal part. At some point, these nuclei, they switch to meiosis, which is this cell cycle specific to germ cells that is necessary for uh, gamete formation after a process of uh, differentiation. So usually C. elegans in the lab are maintained as hermaphrodites. And this means that uh, spermatogenic and oogenic differentiation programs occur in the same animal, but sequentially in time. So P. granules, uh, this is work from many labs uh, during, over the last decades, has shown that P. granules are uh, expressed along germ cell uh, uh, differentiation and they display this beautiful perinuclear localization, and they are usually sitting in the cytoplasmic part of the nuclear pores. They are enriched in polyadenylated mRNAs and proteins, and their formation uh, depends on very active cellular processes, such as uh, the activity of RNA helicases and also active RNA transcription, highlighting again the central role of RNA in their formation, but also uh, their highly dynamic nature. We know now from long time ago that the mutations in core factors promoting P. granule formation affect germ cell proliferation and differentiation, as we can see here in this uh, very atrophied germline that lack uh, oocytes. So this, this uh, mutant suggests that whatever is happening inside these P. granules might be very important uh, for the function uh, of the germline tissue. So one way we have to infer P. granule functions is to study their molecular composition and a conserved feature of animal germline condensates is their enrichment in factors required for the biogenesis and function of 
peewee interacting small RNAs or pi RNAs. These are molecules that regulate gene expression by RNA interference. So briefly, the non-coding small RNA is loaded into an argonaut protein, and the, the small RNA acts as a, as a guide uh, to target, to promote targeting and degradation of the target mRNA. Note that uh, the antisense complementarity that is uh, provided by the small RNA is providing specificity to this gene regulatory mechanism. So pyRNAs have been very well characterized in Drosophila and mice, targeting and silencing transposon and repetitive elements to maintain germinal integrity and function. But this situation uh, in other systems and in C. elegans is quite different. It's quite different, sorry. There are thousands of highly variable pyRNA sequences that are individually expressed in germ cells, and they can target uh, mRNAs without requiring perfect antisense complementarity. So in worms, don't be afraid by this uh, molecular pathway, but in worms, pyrene-mediated silencing requires an amplification step that is uh, by recruiting uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerases to the target transcript. These polymerase synthesize secondary small RNAs using the RNA template, RNA uh, molecule as a template. And these secondary small RNAs are perfectly antisense to the targeted transcript. They are in turn loaded into a nuclear argonaut effector, it is called HRT1, that translocates to the nucleus and can um, promote transcriptional silencing through unknown mechanisms that might be related to the deposition of uh, repressive chromatin marks. The interesting thing is that mutations in components of the pyrene pathway in C. elegans cause very strong fertility defects that are independent on transposon uh, upregulation. So one of the main questions I tried to address during my postdoc in Germano Cecere lab in Institut Pasteur was, okay, how do pyRNA regulation contribute to germ cell function? For this, we characterize the pyRNA pathway functions along germline development, which is a situation that involves very fast and dynamic changes in germline and vulva morphology, germ cell differentiation, and also overall gene expression programs. So we started by sequencing nascent uh, transcripts genome-wide. And during spermatogenesis, we observed a strong transcriptional uh, upregulation of thousands of uh, spermatogenic protein coding genes in pyRNA mutants, uh, in pyRNA pathway mutants compared to wild type, sorry. This suggested that pyRNA pathway targets and repress the transcription of spermatogenic genes, right? I don't have time to go into the details, but uh, immunoprecipitation experiments combined with uh, small RNA sequencing confirm that the nuclear argonaut load, loads secondary small RNAs that are antisense to spermatogenic transcript. And this loading was dependent on pyRNA targeting. So overall confirming a direct repression of spermatogenic genes by the pyRNA pathway. This uh, sounds abstract and complicated, but is, it, this was corroborated in a beautiful uh, in a beautiful phenotype where we followed a GFP tag version of uh, HRD1, the nuclear effector, and uh, in absence of PWE, HRD1 loses its nuclear localization exclusively in those cells undergoing spermatogenic meiosis. Again, reinforcing the idea that the pyRNA pathway signaling is active in germ cells undergoing spermatogenesis. So to assess now the physiological consequences of uh, pyRNA pathway dysfunction, we used single molecule fish to track the transcription of uh, specific spermatogenic targets of the pyRNA pathway. And for this, I was very lucky to, to, to collaborate with Florian Muller and Eric Wernerson uh, to improve together the detection and quantification of single molecule RNA signals from whole worm tissues. Here you can see, for example, the signal from two transcriptional foci from a single uh, germ cell nucleus. But what happened in, uh, in wild-type germlines is that spermatogenic pyrene targets are transcribed by a group of meiotic cells that are at the prox proximal part of the, this packeting uh, region of the germline. And at some point, this transcription is turned off as the germ cells progress through sperm differentiation, which is a process that involves uh, huge changes in nuclear morphology and also condensation, which uh, then lead to the production of mature spermatids that are known to be transcriptionally silent. So in pyrene pathway mutants, we observe that this region of, uh, of transcription is increased 
until this germline loop. And we interpret this phenotype as a defect of turning off this transcription, which is also accompanied or followed by a huge delay in this process of spermatogenic gene uh, cell differentiation, sorry. Uh, as a result, the pyrene mutant germlines are severely delayed in producing mature sperm, and a large fraction of this sperm is not functional, severely affecting uh, fertility of, of these animals. So at this point, we were very satisfied with our results at that time, putting pyrene regulation in physiological context and defining spermatogenic genes as the endogenous targets of C. elegans pyrenees, which was uh, a question that still remained a little bit elusive, trying to understand what those pyrenees are globally targeting uh, in the germline. But at the same time, in parallel, different labs had shown that the C. elegans germ cells not only contain pea granules, but a collection of condensates that interact in the perinuclear region, forming these complex multiphase uh, architectures, as you can see here. In this context, uh, upstream components of the pyrene pathway localized to pea granules. This was something that was known. And downstream components, like the RD, uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase complex, localized to these mutator foci. This means that somehow at the, the molecular pathway, is especially broken uh, inside the cell, like especially they are in di different compartments, right? And this was a little bit puzzling for us because how we could reconcile these observations with, with our molecular data we were so proud of showing that uh, we show a linear and direct regulation of spermatogenic genes by pyranase. We were missing some mechanism, how, how this regulation is, is done in the cell. So we wanted to address this and we quantitatively tracked uh, these uh, condensate pairs along uh, germ cell differentiation. So we, we were looking now at the problem from the condensate scale, let's say. And something we observed is that during spermatogenesis meiosis, these pea granule and mutator foci mix together. Uh, and notice that this condensate fusion or this condensate mixing, I don't know how to, how to, how to say it because we don't really know what's going on there, but we see this mixing effect correlates in space and time with the cascade of these molecular reactions that leads to this pyrene mediated uh, repression of spermatogenic gene transcription in this region of the germline. In addition, this condensate mixing does not happen in absence of pyrenees, as you can see. We never found this condensate fusing, suggesting that there is a functional link between these dynamic changes in uh, germline condensate interactions and the pyrene pathway activity. So overall, Although this is very correlative, these observations to me were very eloquent, and they suggested that the, they suggested the possibility that C. elegans germline condensates contribute to regulate gene expression programs, and that the pea granule is the site of this of this regulation that connects somehow small RNA biology, non-coding small RNA biology, to transcriptional silencing in the nucleus. So this is one possibility. It is our working hypothesis now. And is one of the directions I would like to take. But I will have to say, I have to say that we are entering in muddy waters in very complicated territory, which is uh, because C. elegans is transparent, is great. We can observe pea granules in vivo, it's fantastic. But we need to keep in mind that at the end of the day, we are following one single factor that has been uh, fluorescently labeled. So we don't really know the identity of all the underlying components of the condensate, and we don't know their abundance as well. So in this, context, in this context, using genetics, for example, mutating one single pea granule protein is not the best approach to study how pea granules contribute to a given cellular or developmental um, process. This is how we, we like to think, we like to start thinking. And with this in mind, uh, our efforts are now mainly focused on trying to unbiasedly define the molecular composition of pea granules with high spatial and temporal resolution. And for this, we are trying to isolate P granules in different ways, but in a cell type specific manner during spermatogenesis, for example, and sequence their associated uh, RNAs. Our goal is to determine the molecular identity of the RNAs that are condensing into P granules, and then study the changes in the molecular composition or compositional dynamics during germ cell differentiation. With this type of information, we hope to clarify, at least in, in a specific cellular context, like spermatogenesis, 
what do we mean when we say this is a pigranion, right? And in terms of composition, we want to know if pigranions exist in different molecular configurations along germ cell differentiation, and whether these configurations relate to different pigranion functions, for, for example. So we think that starting with a description of pigranion transcriptomes will help us to generate hypotheses about the mechanisms that are underlying pigranion formation and also their potential roles in, in germ engine regulation. So in parallel, we are also exploring other research lines. We want to perform also, uh, we take advantage of the power of the genetic screenings in C. elegans to try to isolate mutants affecting this pig granule mixing with mutated foci and try to discover unknown mechanisms that might connect this condensate mixing with uh, pyrene-mediated gene regulation during spermatogenesis. We are also trying to develop uh, approaches. This is more wild or more We'll see what happens. We're trying to develop approaches to perturbate the pig granule homeostasis in vivo, but avoiding the use of mutants to assess, for example, whether changes in the biophysical properties of pig granules might correlate with uh, any germ cell phenotype. And then we can start to look inside these, uh, these altered granules to, to try to link at the molecular level why these alterations at the condensate scale uh, affect the tissue or or, or the self, right? So overall, our long-term our long-term goal is to describe in vivo the molecular processes that are happening inside pigranules in a particular uh, cellular context, and test the relevance of pigranule condensation if we can to gene regulation and provide molecular models about all these things that I'm I'm saying. I'm I hate and I apologize for staying so superficial and theoretical in this part, but we are just starting the lab, as I say, we are looking forward to do more experimental work in these directions. The lab is new, but as you can see, it's functional and we have different open positions to come. So this is thanks to the funding from the French Atip Avenir and, uh, and the unit for now. And so please don't hesitate to, to take a picture of this slide. Uh, the, the website is still uh, in preparation. And spread the word or, or contact me if you want to discuss in more details any anything related to the project or to small RNAs to, to condensate. We, we are really looking forward to it. So now I don't know if uh, I have time, we have time for a short discussion, but I'd be happy to yeah, to briefly briefly exchange with you um, in case you have any question or to clarify something. Uh, I don't know, Alex, how it works, but should yeah. I stop um, sharing? The, the up I mean, we do have a question already um, in the Q&A box. And that question is, do you know whether the PRI RNA plays an analogous, ah, sorry, let me say that again. Do you know whether the PI RNA pathway plays an analogous role during oogenesis? Yeah, this, that's a good question because, and I didn't show for, for simplicity, but uh, for example, uh, we, we didn't see any uh, anything similar to what I shown during spermatogenesis. There is not a direct, Transcriptional regulation during oogenesis, and this I can I can take back to this. For example, here we see this very visual phenotype where the the nuclear argonaut disappears from from this type of cells during oogenesis. Strikingly, they are identical. The wild type, the localization of the nuclear argonaut in wild type germlines and pyrene mutant, we don't see any change. And in the transcriptional uh, genome wide datasets, we don't really see a huge signature of of anything uh, going uh, upregulated or unregulated related to orogenic uh, genes. So it's really sperm specific. Great, thank you. Um, so I have a couple of questions while people um, type theirs in. So my first is about the first half of your talk and you mentioned how the PRNAs are repressing the spastogenesis genes from being expressed too early essentially. So it sounds like these genes are sort of poised and ready for transcription. Um, is there any reason you can think of why these genes need to be ready to go quite quickly rather than sort of transcription factor mediated expression later on? I'm not sure I, I understood the question. Can you repeat? Because I, I hear your your volume cut sometimes. So oh, right. Okay. I was just wondering why um, the, uh, the spermatogenesis genes are poised ready for transcription, but are then inhibited by PRNAs, whether there's a, another mechanism, well, whether it uh, sort of Occam's razor mechanism will just be have them ready to transcription at the time that they're ready. Why they why would they be ready ahead of time? If I understand well, I mean, there 
the, this uh, uh, spermatogenic gene repression by pyranase is not the only mechanism that that represses spermatogenic transcription. Right. There are other small RNA pathways that that also target spermatogenic genes, like the 26G RNAs uh, that are associated to other argonaut proteins known as ALG3 and ALG4. It's not really clear the, the mechanism, but it's known that they also target spermatogenic genes for repression. Then, right. um, to follow up with the question, it's why, uh, if I, I, what's, what's the next part of the question that I missed? Um, so, but I might not understand the system well, but it, it sounded to me like these spermatogenesis genes are, are poised to transcribe pretty much immediately, but they're being repressed. Yeah, um, so it seems like a sort of negative way of doing it. It would be more intuitive, perhaps, to have these activated when they're ready rather than pressed when they're not ready. I wondered if you had any sort of evolutionary context to why that why that would happen. Yeah, something that I, I didn't mention in the, during the presentation because it, it was in the paper as well. That one question is, for example, if sperma, if pyranase targets spermatogenic genes, how how it how it happens that at some point they are expressed, right? If mm -hmm. if pyranase are there to to silence. And we found out that there is another small RNA pathway that uh, also targets spermatogenic uh, genes early on during the transcription of spermatogenic genes during mm -hmm. the cycle while germ cells go through germ cell differentiation in early steps these uh, mRNAs that are early transcribed spermatogenic genes are protected by another uh, small RNA pathway that is the Caesar one pathway so somehow these mRNAs are protected by Caesar and pyranase cannot access uh, to silence. Then, this we measure is just uh, molecularly uh, the, the targeting of spermatogenic genes by this Caesar one pathway, by the protective pathway, is lost as we go through spermatogenesis, and then they are more accessible for pyrene mediated uh, gene silencing. Then, why spermatogenic genes? I don't have a, a clear idea. I have only speculation, but we are talking about pathways that regulate gene expression based on uh, sequence specificity, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and pyranase do, do not have this uh, sequence specificity, so they might target everything. Um, I can think about spermatogenic genes as one of the genes in the, in the, in the organism that, that are subjected to more ev evolutive pressure. And they might change their, their nucleotides, their bases, faster than the rest of the genes. So if you rely on small RNAs to, to turn off transcription of spermatogenic genes, you want a pathway or a system that is effective, but not very specific in yeah. And maybe pyRNAs are co-opted to, to do this function. I don't know if all this answers your question, but those were things that we didn't know really the answer, but we, we were always speculating with these possibilities. But okay, yeah. it's nice this, uh, this balance between the protection and then uh, silencing, which is something that was already shown previously in, uh, in for GFP reporters that get silenced by pyRNAs in the germline. But was not shown in a, in a physiological context. Okay, great, thank you. We have one last question from the audience. So, when you see your condensates, the p granules and the mutator granules, come together, is it possible to track whether there's a change in the dynamic motion of one or other type of the granule? I.e., is there some active regulation to bring them together? Is it a possible? to track whether there's a change in dynamic motion. Yeah, so if you imagine they're sort of free floating in the cell, do they have more directional movement to bring themselves together? So if I understand well, is if any of these two condensates is directed towards one side or the other, or if we can, well, what we did in our, in our work is exactly to try to image these condensate pairs in vivo mm -hmm. to get the whole journey. And then we, we segmented this in 3D, as if were, and then to extract the, the, the centers of these granules. And then we did this tracking of the dynamic motion through the, the, the germ cell uh, differentiation. And quantitatively, we measured the distances between closer condensate pairs. This is how we did. And I don't know if it answers the, the question, because then when we, we applied the mutation, the PV knockout, absence of pyRNAs, we didn't see this, uh, this fusion, let's say. Mm -hmm. and we were able to calculate this difference based on this method I, I explained. I don't know if this answers the question. But majority... <laughs> I think so, but if the, if the audience member wants to clarify, I'm sure they can yeah, follow up with you. Let's see if, yeah, if I'm not clear. Great. Thank you very much. I think we'll move on to our next speaker. Thank you, Eric.